So I'd love to introduce Debbie Roos, and um, we're really excited. She's going to be talking about landscaping for wildlife with native plants. And um, since 1999, Debbie has been an agricultural agent for Chatham County Center of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. And, um, and I always say that Debbie's the best extension agent in the world, which I'm sure you will all agree with me about that. Um, where she's responsible for programming in the areas of commercial vegetable production, organic production, pollinator conservation, alternative agricultural enterprises, forestry, and beekeeping. And um, besides that, she's always thinking ahead, wondering what farmers need and, and coming up with programs to address new things like how to use a square at a market. <laughs> how many other agents ever did that? Um, so Debbie worked for three years as an agroforestry extension agent and technical trainer for the Peace Corps in Senegal, West Africa, mm -hmm. and later completed graduate degrees in applied anthropology and horticulture at the University of Florida. Debbie delivers educational pro programming to growers through regular workshops and her award-winning Growing Small Farms website, which um, I refer people to all the time whenever they ask about any vegetable or cover crop or anything to do with farming, she has it on there. Um, Debbie is passionate about pollinator conservation and has planted demonstration habitats and developed resources to teach others about the importance of bees and other pollinators to our agriculture ecosystem. In 2019, Debbie received the Governor's Conservation Achievement Award as the Wildlife Conservationist of the Year from the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. All right. Well, again, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Um, Nancy, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and so I'm going to talk tonight about kind of general um, landscaping for wildlife using native plants. And I'm hoping I, I can tell y'all that um, I'm getting such spring fever already. When I start looking back at my photos of the garden, you know, after this dreary, rainy, cold weather. <laughs> so maybe maybe you'll get infected with the spring fever as well. Uh, it's going to be here before we know it. Of that, I feel sure. Um, so just to give you um, a little bit of background on why I'm talking about this, um, um, as Nancy mentioned, I have a, a, a master's in horticulture, but my horticulture degree is focused all on vegetable production. Uh, I work primarily with farmers. That's the main part of my job, mostly organic farmers here in Chatham County. So I... Um, you know, my experience with ornamentals has come um, later and just kind of on my own. I didn't have a single class in ornamental horticulture when I was in, in, in college, believe it or not. They were a completely separate department. So I, I kind of like to share that with people because if I can do it, you can do it. You know, it's kind of learn by doing ethic, I guess. Um, my, my work in the ornamental horticulture realm has been focused primarily on pollinator habitat. Um, but one of the things I've learned, didn't take me long to learn this, is that when you plant for pollinators, you're also supporting a lot of other wildlife. All the photos you see in this presentation were taken by me in the pollinator garden in Pittsburgh, um, it, unless you see someone else's name on it. There's a few exceptions to that. So um, the things that you see in this presentation are things that you could also see in your garden if you plant for pollinators. So let's start out by thinking about what does wildlife need? So there are some obvious things, you know, the obviously food in all kinds of forms, you know, seeds, nuts, leaves, nectar, pollen, insects. They need water. They need protective cover from predators and the elements. They need nesting sites and they certainly need protection from harmful pesticides. There's a, a different ways that they can get those needs or that we can provide those needs uh, through our, our landscapes, through fields and woodlands. And tonight I'm gonna be focusing on uh, what we can do in our, our home uh, landscapes for wildlife. So the typical landscape in suburbia um, is about 90% lawn. I mean, this is a house down the road from me. I live in a rural area. And, you know, many of our housing sites, only about, um, uh, you know, most of the trees have been cleared to where only about 10% of the uh, uh, pre-existing tree biomass is currently there. 
So you've lost a lot of uh, native species there. And you know most of these suburban landscapes are just full of non-native plants. And that has repercussions for, for wildlife as we will see, and as I'm sure you're aware. So, you know, the thing I, I really like to get people excited about is I really do feel that individually we can make a difference. You know, we can, if everybody did their part, I think we would be a lot better off. So, you know, thinking about the choices that you make in your landscape can, can be part of the big picture as a fix, you know, and, and help restore these ecological services. And, you know, if you start building back up those native species and supporting the food web, you're going to be vastly rewarded with, you know, sightings of wildlife and also having, you know, better pollination and pest control and the like. So, you know, different things that you can do, you know, certainly if you've got an issue with invasive species, that would be a, a great place to start. Um, that could be a whole nother talk. And I'm sure that y'all have had talks on that, I would imagine. You know, think about um, if you have a lot of lawn, thinking about minimizing that lawn area. And it was Doug Tallamy who said, um, and I'll talk about him in a minute. You know, think of your lawn, think of having a lawn as an area rug instead of wall to wall carpeting, which is what a lot of us have. Um, you know, it has its place. Certainly a lawn has its place, but it, you know, if you can fill in with something uh, more beneficial, that'd be great. And think about beyond landscaping, what other, uh, hardscape decisions you can make. You know, that could be from uh, changing your lighting so that it's not a constant, um, you know, floodlights in your yard at night, you know, adding water features, supporting um, bee nesting sites, creating uh, shelters for reptiles and amphibians and things like that. Those are non-planting things that you can do. And then of course you can plant native plants that support wildlife. And I, I love to remind people it doesn't do any good to build a beautiful, um, you know, wildlife habitat if you're not going to be careful about your use of pesticides. So that's an important part of the picture. You can network with your neighbors and help, um, you know, expand and, and get uh, everybody working together to um, increase that habitat in your, in your community. And then, of course, if you have domestic pets. Um, again, it doesn't do any good to, you know, support this beautiful bird habitat if you're letting your cats run around and murder birds. So, you know, controlling pets that harm wildlife. So now we're going to talk about uh, landscaping for wildlife. Um, and um, again, as I mentioned earlier, most of the photos in here were taken in this little pollinator garden uh, in Pittsburgh. So the first thing is thinking about the basic steps you can take, um, you know, consider taking an inventory of what you already have, that existing vege vegetation. There's certainly, you know, likely going to be some things that you might want to remove, um, some things that are good that you could augment, add more, um, and then think about developing that landscape design. I, I do encourage you to start small, and that's what I've done. Um, uh, I've built it slowly over time, and it's more likely to succeed if you do that. The best time to plant these uh, native perennials, tree shrubs, vines, grasses is in the fall, so September to December. I mean, you can plant year-round in our climate, but um, the plants get a much better advantage um, if they're planted in the fall. They can overwinter and get nice and um, build up that root system before the, the heat and sometimes, remember when we used to have droughts, <laughs> can, can hit in the spring. And then after you do your plantings, you know, it's important that they get about an inch of water a week for that first year after you plant. Uh, sadly, I think a lot of people um, underestimate this step or, or don't quite carry it through and then they wonder why their perennials are not coming back. So when I'm planting in my pollinator habitat, I always, you know, if mother nature didn't provide an inch of water a week, I do it. And I just do it for that first year. And then pretty much after that, I don't have to water. These are very drought tolerant plants. So let's look at some general guidelines for landscaping for wildlife. Uh, I, I obviously like to encourage people to emphasize native plants. I know you're a native plant society, so that's appropriate. Um, and, you know, the fact is that native plants support many species of wildlife. This is backed up by research. I, I assume most of y'all are, are familiar with uh, Doug Tallamy. He is a University of Delaware entomologist who's written 
some fantastic books that'll really change your thinking about plant selection. Um, his first book, Bringing Nature Home, is very eye-opening. It's full of data about you know, how the choices we make in our landscape affect wildlife. Um, you know, and basically when you're looking around and seeing, you know, hostas and Bradford pears and crepe myrtles and lawn, that is a very sterile environment that is not supportive of wildlife and we can do better. And it's not a sacrifice to plant native plants. You're going to get every bit the beauty that you would get with some of these exotics that, that people like. But you know, it's it's um it's really important to support the food web through those native plants. His um, more recent book is Nature's Best Hope. I highly recommend those if you don't have them. But you know, when you're thinking about the food web, um, caterpillars are, are essential. You know, it's funny as an extension agent, especially for the extension agents that work with home gardeners. You know, we get a you know, especially in the um, previous time. You know, everybody wants to know, how do I kill these caterpillars? This is terrible. These are eating my plants. And I'm like, uh, I plant things specifically so caterpillars do eat them. <laughs> so sometimes you're looking at a, a shift in thinking. Um, people don't understand. Um, but caterpillars are required if you care about songbirds. You know, 96% of our terrestrial birds uh, rear their, their, in, their young on insects. And these are primarily caterpillars because they're very soft and easy to swallow and digest. So uh, Doug Tallamy's done some amazing research. He's really looked at how uh, plant selection affects songbird reproduction. And he did a three-year study uh, looking at, at that very topic um, and found, you know, for a pair of uh, chickadees, it takes um, the, the mom and dad work from sunup to sundown to bring back caterpillars to feed their young, an average of one caterpillar every three minutes. And it takes six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of chickadees. And uh, they're getting these caterpillars from native plants because those are the plants that are hosts for these caterpillars. So um, he would tell stories about, they would find a nest full of uh, ne dead nestlings and sunflower seeds. And that had happened because, you know, about a week or two into rearing these nestlings, um, the, the parent birds had run out of caterpillars that they, they couldn't find anymore. And so they started bringing back sunflower seeds to the babies because that's what the parents ate, but then the, the nestlings would starve to death. They're not able to eat sunflower seeds. And that's very heartbreaking. Um, Talamy also talks a lot about uh, keystone. He uses the word keystone. So this is a concept that's been in ecology for a long time. Keystone species are used to um, uh, describe species that play a really vital role in the ecosystem. So if they were not there, it would be, everything would be much different. So he's taken that concept and um, applied it to plants, you know, specifically to plants and what he calls keystone plants. So these are things that he's kind of zeroed in on that um, if, you, if you look at these keystone plants that can have a big effect on the abundance and diversity of other species. So these plants are essential to the food web. And if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in helping wildlife, you definitely want to include some of these. So research has shown that a landscape that doesn't have these keystone plants are gonna support 70 to 75% fewer caterpillar species than a landscape that does include this keystone genera. And keep in mind that not all native plants are created equal. So there's about 5% of our native plants that host 75% of the caterpillars. So these are the ones you're gonna to wanna to kind of zero in on. And I'm gonna give you some of those later. So other continuing on with these guidelines, um, creating layers that mimic nature when you're uh, deciding how to plant um, you know, in your landscape. So think about uh, vertical vegetation structure. So you don't wanna have you know, your landscape to be full of plants that are like three feet high. You want all of those multiple layers from the canopy, mid-story shrub down to ground covers. That's gonna provide the habitat that, that different species of wildlife requires. And also plant a diversity of plants that are gonna provide um, the food that these, this wildlife needs throughout the entire year. So we're gonna be looking in more detail at some of these but just some shots, these are all shots from the pollinator garden in the spring. And here's some summer and fall. And um, I mentioned the keystone plants earlier. So some of those keystone plants, some examples would be oaks, 
Uh, they support 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and so other examples of keystone plants would include native cherries, maples, hickories. Um, you know, some of these are tr uh, trees and some are perennials like goldenrods and sunflowers and asters. I also encourage you to include native grasses for shelter, nesting sites, and food. So these provide uh, nutritious seed and nesting material for birds. Uh, some of our cavity nesting uh, native bees like bumblebees also like to nest at the base of grasses. And they also provide a lot of shelter and cover for a lot of wildlife. And it's important if you're gonna go to the trouble to plant native grasses, don't cut them back in the fall when they die back. <laughs> I never quite understand that. I mean, the two main reasons you have grasses in your landscape is A, to provide shelter um, for and cover for wildlife, but also to have some structure in the winter. So I never quite understand when people cut them back the minute they're not green anymore. Mine are still in the pollinator garden. They're all there. They won't get cut back until early March, most likely, right before they're about to start growing again. There's some beautiful native grasses out there. These are some that I have in the pollinator garden. Uh, the muley grass, split beard blue stem, the prairie drop seed, um, uh, little blue stem, switch grass. They're all different heights and they have different bloom periods. Um, you know, like prairie drop seed, that the seed was used to make flour by the Native Americans. Or I just, I love the native grasses. I've kind of slowly over the years become more and more in love with them and love adding new species. I did add a few new species this fall. Um, here's some uh, pictures of bum bumblebees nesting at the base of grasses. Um, they're hard, you probably have just walked right over this and never even knew it was happening. It's also important to consider leaving a portion of your landscape undisturbed. Um, um, usually this is going to be kind of at the back of your property. I realize some of y'all have, you know, HOA requirements or you, you know, worried about having an untidy, uh, you know, yard or getting flack from your neighbors, but it, this can be done. But um, it's really nice to have that undisturbed area. So where there's no mowing, you're not tilling or planting, and that helps conserve that nesting and overwintering habitat. So this could include, you know, dead trees, stumps, brush piles, rock piles. You know, um, these provide very valuable habitat for a lot of different species of wildlife. Also leaf litter, you know, um, a lot of uh, Xerces has a campaign called Leave the Leaves. You know, all those leaves that these suburban gardeners love to rake up and bag and throw away. Um, there's got a lot of, a lot of um, uh, insects are overwintering in there uh, in various stages. So you're, you're, you're basically ending their life cycle. And they also provide a lot of benefits, of course, to the soil. But it's, um, it's um, research has shown us that these high uh, unmanaged sites that have a lot of grasses in different layers, that's also very supportive of uh, bumblebee diversity. So we do care about that. So now I'm going to kind of go through uh, different groups of wildlife. We're going to start with the pollinators. Um, so just a little background on the um, on my pollinator paradise garden. Um, some of y'all have probably visited it. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, um, we're not doing any tours now, but it's completely open to the public. You're welcome to come. Uh, this is a, a, a project that I planted back in 2008 with some private grant funds. And it's really grown over the years. Um, now it has over 225 species and 85% of them are native. Uh, the non-native space species tend to be herbs uh, for the most part. Um, it's open to the public 24 seven. Um, I have a small group of volunteers that helps me manage it. We do everything organically. I don't use any uh, pesticides there other than an occasional organic fire ant treatment. Um, and it's a really important tool for me. I use it for outreach and education. So I do in normal years, I do lots of, you know, I do all day workshops. I have garden tours for groups all over the state. Um, through COVID, I've been kind of, um, you know, pivoting to um, I do virtual garden tours. I, I love to take pictures and videos. So that's a way that I can um, get people excited about it, even if they're not there in person. And, um, you know, you're going to get the, the, the website uh, later. I mean, that's it right there, carolinapollinatorgarden.org. I've got a lot of information on the website. Um, so uh, for pollinators, um, we'd already mentioned planting a diversity of plants. So for pollinators specifically, 
you know, you really want to focus on uh, getting that diversity of blooms from early spring to late fall. And that'll help to track the diversity of pollinators because pollinators come in all sizes, different tongue lengths. Um, and so these different types of flowers, some are, are very shallow and open, others are, are, you know, complex tubular flowers. Those all attract different um, pollinators and different colors, shapes, and sizes all have their niche. Um, so you've got tiny pollinators like this small carpenter bee, this Serotina species, uh, this eastern tail blue on a little geranium, one of our smaller butterflies. And then you've got your big pollinators like this bumblebee that can just kind of muscle its way and open and push open that flower and get what it wants. And again, you've got a long tongue pollinators like bumblebees that can reach deep into a flower and um, you know, other long tongue, of course, your butterflies with the long proboscis. And then you have short tongue pollinators like this sweat bee uh, and surfid flies. So again, if you're trying to attract a diversity, that's why it's important to have that diversity of blooms. And um, specifically on the bees, we have over 560 species of native bees in North Carolina. And each one is unique with different, um, you know, different uh, behaviors and, and habitats. So you want to have um, at least three to five species blooming during each season for pollinators. So that's real easy to do. Um, you know, typically uh, in the, I have about 60 in the pollinator garden, you, you know, 45 to 60 species during any one week. You don't need that many. I kind of did that just to show, you know, what the options are. Um, so that's just keep that in mind. Um, some of the seasonal interests that you can see uh, in the fall. So, you know, late blooming species and uh, the grasses that are blooming, you're getting your seed heads and your, your fall color and your berries that are important for birds. And then even in the winter, you've got some of your evergreen species like your yucca and your um, Ilex, the um, gallberry and also seed heads and, and grasses. So that on the bottom left, that's your um, panicum, your switchgrass. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, again, leaving those dried seed heads, I think they're beautiful. This is a uh, ironweed in front with some uh, bee balm seed heads in the back. It looks beautiful and it's providing that food for the birds. So another uh, kind of trick you can do is once you find a plant that's highly attractive to pollinators, because not all plants are equally attractive to pollinators, then I plant multiple species of it. So for example, with the aster uh, in my in my pollinator garden, I have 13 different species of native aster, and that really helps extend the bloom season. Um, and the asters start blooming in the summer and go all the way late, late, late fall. Uh, each of these is different, different color blooms, different size blooms. Uh, some like part shade, some like full sun. Some kind of have a mounded uh, growth habit. Others have a very open growth habit. Um, you know, and again, and each one again helps attract different pollinators. Similarly with the goldenrod, I've got 12 different species of goldenrod, some very tall, some short. Um, and just really helps attract those different um, pollinator species. All the plants I have in the garden, by the way, are listed on my website. So you can download and print that, that uh, list. Uh, milkweed, I've got uh, 10 different native milkweed species in the garden. Uh, um, again, some like wet, some like dry. Some of the species prefer part shade, you know, like your Sclepias variegata um, and a different color. Um, fragrance, that kind of thing. So I, I love the milkweeds. Um, you know, some like this uh, world milkweed, Asclepias verticillata, have a very, very narrow leaf and a tiny white flower. And then you have the very coarse leafed, um, you know, common milkweed here. So also uh, in a pollinator habitat, you're including host plants for butterflies, of course, and be happy and uh, when you get your caterpillars. So uh, here's a monarch laying an egg on um, uh, Sclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed. So when you see them bend their abdomen, um, it's always fun to go see if you can spot the egg. Uh, here's a, a larva, a monarch caterpillar uh, feeding on uh, butterfly weed. Here's just a little um, 
I, I, I find it very soothing to watch caterpillars chomp on leaves. <laughs> it's like the sewing machine, you know, where it starts at one side and goes to the other. I, I could just watch that all day. I don't know. Hopefully y'all are able to see the little video. It's actually working for you. Um, this is a monarch caterpillar feeding on a swamp milkweed. Okay. You can see great. There we go. I could watch it all day, but I got to move on. Um, black swallowtail. So here um, is the native host, one of the native hosts for the black swallowtail, which people commonly see the caterpillars on our non-native plants, like fennel and dill and parsley. Queen Anne's lace, but this is the native host, Zizia aria. Um, and here's a shot of the caterpillar um, when they're first, when they're small, uh, early instar, they kind of resemble bird poop, helps to, you know, make them not attractive to predators. Uh, here's a picture of the caterpillar um, on a stem, chomp, chomp. And the pipe vine swallowtail, I don't see a lot of the adults as much. They're, they're not as uh, frequent, but, um, you certainly can see the, the larvae. And um, I planted pipe vine on a cedar trellis that we built. It's a really cool flower, Aristolochia, really unusual. And I love seeing the caterpillars. Here's a caterpillar that just hatched from the eggs, very, very tiny on, on a bloom stem. And here's, you know, a few days later, they, you know, feeding in the groups. Um, and then here's a picture, you know, here's a little video of some of the young caterpillars munching on a leaf. It's so fun. I only have, you know, one area where I have the pipe vine in the garden. So um, once I spot the adults laying eggs, every time I visit the garden, I go over there and look for the caterpillars. It's so much fun to see them, and, you know, and go through the, and I, and I get several generations of them throughout the year. And here's the, the, uh, the latest, the last instar caterpillar, gorgeous caterpillar. And then I'll see them climbing up, you know, leaving the host plant and climbing away to pupate somewhere. Uh, then you have your spice bush swallowtails. Um, there's the host spice bush. This is they they lay a single leaf, usually on the underside of a leaf, uh, a single egg, excuse me. And there's the adult on obedient plant. And I just think they have one of the most gorgeous caterpillars here. This is on a spice bush leaf. And often you see before, especially when the caterpillars are small and difficult to spot you may first notice the rolled up leaves on your spice bush. So if you see rolled up leaves, you can very carefully go over and gently unroll them. And very likely you're gonna spot the caterpillar inside. They, they spin a silk and fold the leaf over on top of them. Um, the, the leaf uh, has a phytochemical that makes the caterpillar sensitive to sunlight when they feed on it. So they often are found feeding at night. They'll come out at night and kind of stay hidden in the leaves during the day but it's like, I see you in there. <laughs> uh, here's some other caterpillars I spot often in the late summer, early fall, the hummingbird clear wing moth, especially on our native coral honeysuckle, beautiful caterpillar. And there is the adult on the bottom right, one of our uh, day flying clear wing moths, the hummingbird moth. The variegated fritillary, uh, this is an egg on passion flower, purple passion flower vine, which is their, one of their hosts. I just happened to see the adult laying the egg. That's really the only way I could find that little tiny egg. Otherwise I would have just maybe stumbled across it. But once I saw the adult doing that fluttering and the abdomen bending, I went and got my camera and, and got a picture of the egg. Beautiful adult, uh, here's the purple passion flower. And there's a picture of the variegated fritillary caterpillar, which I was seeing in the garden, even in December this year, believe it or not. Obviously, they weren't really going to make it all the way through their life cycle at that point. This is kind of neat. I was working in the garden one day and I noticed um, the variegated fritillary um, caterpillar curled up in the J shape, which means they're about to pupate. This was on a stemless ironweed plant. And by the end of the day, after I worked all day, this middle picture, I could see that it was starting to kind of um, thicken at the bottom, actually forming the chrysalis. And then I went back the next morning and on the far right and the chrysalis was fully formed. I think it's one of the most beautiful chrysalids uh, that I've seen. Here's another view of a different you know, plant, different chrysalid. Isn't that just beautiful though? My goodness, it's like a work of art. So keep your eye out for those as well. 
And then um, there's a great publication NC State has called Butterflies in Your Backyard that will give you more ideas for things that you can plant for butterflies. I mean, I, I do specifically plant things like spice bush, pipe vine, obviously the milkweeds to be a butterfly host plant. But other than that, with all the different diversity I have, it just naturally provides host plants. I don't even go out of my way necessarily. Um, also, just to, so you know, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an insect nut. I just get excited about pretty much any insect. When you plant for pollinators, you just naturally are going to attract a lot of different cool predators and parasitoids. Um, so here, and I'm happy to do that. I get excited when I see them. Last year was a lot of fun. I'm pretty obsessed with spiders, <laughs> um, especially specifically green link spiders last year. I, I love, um, once I find one in the garden, I monitor it because they tend to stay on the same plant for the entire season. And I will go monitor it. I'll check on my little friend, see how it's grown. I'll look for the egg case in the fall. And then I'll, uh, I, this year for the first time, I even got to see the um, spiderlings hatch out of the egg case and followed that progress. And they, and, and, and I had a, over a dozen egg cases that I knew about in the garden and I, and I saw all the spiderlings hatch. There were many more obviously that I couldn't see. Uh, the green link spider in the upper link has caught a, a robber fly. So that was like, whoa. I had never seen that. A robber fly in itself is a very uh, fierce uh, predator, an aerial predator. And um, I saw, I have three different pictures of three different spiders catching the robber fly. So that is, that is a thing, apparently. It wasn't just a, um, a fluke. Um, a um, different robber fly in the middle. You've got your predatory stink bugs. Um, you've got your little amphibians, you've got wheel bugs, our largest assassin bugs, you've got skinks, just all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, one more, there's that, there's that bee panther, that one of our robber flies on the left. You've got ambush bugs, lady beetles, crab spiders, love the jumping spiders. I go gaga over jumping spiders whenever I see them. And then of course the little uh, Carolina anoles, those are my little friends. I love seeing them out there. So I'm going to go quickly, very quickly, because I have information on this on my website, on my top 25 native pollinator plants. Uh, for the spring, um, I like the native spiderwort. It can handle part shade um, and it'll rebloom in the fall. So that's really nice. Uh, I've got several species of beard tongue or pinstamen. In this shot, you can see a little sweat bee up top and then a bumblebee. So it's very, very popular with the bees. Um, just so here's the Pinstamen small eye, the smalls beard tongue. And remember, I know I'm going kind of quickly, but you, you can look back at the recording. Um, I love the Baptisias, the wild indigos. I've got several species of those. Um, this is the Baptisia alba, the white Baptisia that blooms a little later. And they provide a nice three seasons of interest there. Here's, here's a, a cultivar called Carolina Moonlight with an American bumblebee. Uh, here's the golden Alexander uh, with a mining bee, the Zizia aurea. Um, so it's a great, uh, attracts a lot of the pollinators. And it's also, as I mentioned earlier, the native host for the black swallowtail caterpillar. Uh, an American lady on coneflower. Uh, coneflowers, I have them as spring bloom, but really they bloom um, throughout the year uh, into the fall. And I've got several species as well as multiple cultivars of coneflowers. I love the galardias, the blanket flowers. Again, they start blooming in the spring. And if you keep them deadheaded, they'll bloom all the way through the fall. Very drought tolerant. Stokes aster is an evergreen and it blooms primarily in the spring. There's a little leaf cutter bee on this one. Um, and uh, sometimes you get a little bit of rebloom on them in the fall. In this case, um, um, I mean, I, I can't cover everything, but um, we could have a whole discussion on cultivars versus straight species. Uh, and that's a whole nother talk. But um, th in this case for the Stokes Aster, there is a particular cultivar that I prefer. It's, this is this one called Peachy's Pick. And just for the record, I have, I, my strategy is I, I don't avoid cultivars. Um, sometimes they don't provide um, all the uh, benefits to wildlife, but it really depends. Some research has shown that in some cases, cultivars are more beneficial to pollinators. 
Um, but I make sure I have both. I have straight species and the cultivars, okay? Uh, here's just a combination, Stoke, Stokes Aster with coneflower and mountain mint. Now bee balm, the Monardos, again, multiple species of that. Some like, um, you know, part shade, uh, some like full sun. Um, and then the New Jersey tea is a really nice late spring blooming shrub, uh, Ceanothus, really nice uh, deciduous shrub, and especially a, a bumblebee magnet in this case. But you'll see lots of different pollinators, so lots of native bees and other uh, uh, you know, soldier beetles and surfid flies and whatnot. Just some more shots from the spring, just to give you a little of that spring fever. Um, I'm gonna kind of quickly go through this because I'm kind of watching the time. Um, yeah, you can see I'm a fan for the ba ba Baptisius. <laughs> this is one of my non-natives. It's a it's a U.S. native called Prairie Purple Prairie Clover, but I, I do make exceptions. You know, I, I carefully I give a lot of thought to bringing in non-natives. Um, but I, I don't think you should only plant natives, but I certainly emphasize natives. And like I said, over 85% of my plants are native, but I, I don't have a problem bringing in some non-natives like this Dahlia purpurea because it's highly attractive and beneficial to our bees. Uh, this is the downy wood mint, which I love, Blophilia ciliata with some uh, uh, butterfly weed. Um, Monarda citriodora and uh, coneflower and some coreopsis more of the downy wood mint and the uh, Amsonia and Baptisia. Some more layers. Here's our little buddy on uh, Possum Hall by Burnham Newdom. He's got a bee in his mouth. <laughs> Everybody's got to eat. Yep. Just more of the, um, the, the Carolina Moonlight with the Amsonia. I, I, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the plants in the garden, well, let's just say pretty much, with the exception of a couple of species, are all done with transplants. I really wanted to get our native thistle in the garden. No nurseries carry it, zero, zero, zero nurseries carry it. Um, and so I ordered uh, this the seed of our native thistle. We have multiple species. This is Circium discolor. And after a few tries of direct seeding it, I, I was rewarded for the first time last year with blooms. You should have heard me cheering. I love it. And the bees love it. Everybody had a party. So I was really, really pleased with that. And um, it took two years for it to bloom from direct seed. But and so we'll see what happens this year. It's a great, gorgeous plant. Butterflies love it as well. Just another view of the spring. That's a, a staghorn sumac with coneflower. So summer blooming, some of my favorite summer blooming species, of course, the Laetris, um, Blazing Star, I have several species of that, several different species, probably about eight or so. There's a sweat bee, uh, looks great with coneflowers. Um, the mountain mints, I've got um, eight different species of native mountain mint, which I think we have about 12 native to North Carolina. That is going to attract a tremendous diversity of pollinators. You know, if, if I had a top 10 list, Pycnanthemum would be on it. Um, so just keep that in mind. Here's a buckeye. Um, the butterfly weed, as I mentioned, I've got 10 different species of milkweed. This is a carpenter mimic leafcutter bee. Uh, this is the swamp milkweed, which in spite of the name can perfectly tolerate average dry soil. Um, Culver's root, uh, y'all should get excited about this, Veronicastrum virginicum, uh, underutilized species. It loves damp soil. I have damp soil and no place in the pollinator garden. So I'm pushing the, pushing the limits on some of these plants, but I've learned that uh, a lot of these plants that are known as wetland plants actually do just fine in a dry land garden. So this blooms for a couple of months. Uh, I just love it and the bees love it. This is, oh, I just love it, it's gorgeous. There it is mixed with coneflowers and uh, bee balm and liatris. Isn't that pretty? And then um, uh, this is the uh, Joe Pye relative, uh, Eupatorium perfoliatum, bone set. It's beautiful, long blooming. Also tolerates wet soil, but doesn't require it. Now the lobelias, you're probably more familiar with the red cardinal flower, uh, Lobelia cardinalis. Um, I, that really prefers a little more moisture and shade than I have. So I do better with the great blue Lobelia syphilitica, although the deer love it. So I have to be careful. I'm often relocating it away from, you know, the deer, higher deer trafficked beds. 
Um, I love Rattlesnake Master. Uh, it's a very unusual plant, uh, just disc, disc flowers. Um, and it's a very architectural plant, attracts a tremendous diversity of pollinators as well, like this Scoliad wasp. Uh, there's a view of it. I just love it. It's beautiful. Very prickly though. The blue vervain, verbena hastata, very small flower. It attracts a lot of our native bees like this carpenter mimic leaf cutter. Um, uh, St. John's wort is one of my favorite shrubs. Uh, this is a uh, Hypericum frondosum and it, this is a cultivar called Sunburst. Um, and it's beloved, especially by the honeybees and the bumblebees. Those are the two primary bees I see on it. Um, the button bush is one of those wetland plants that I have, I think, converted some people on. Uh, I have it in a, a parking lot island. It couldn't be more dry. And it blooms from June to October. <laughs> what would you not like about that? I love it. And it's got this, I love weird flowers like these white spiky blooms. And you'll see lots of different pollinators, bees, butterflies, beetles, flies, all kinds of things on it. The deer do like it though. Yes, they do. So I've had to, again, I've had to give it up in certain beds that get too many, too much deer pressure. Uh, Joe pie weed, um, this is, um, oh, it used to be Eupatorium, uh, Eutrochium dubium. So there's many species of Joe pie weed, but it is also just a, 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 a magnet. It tracks a lot of diversity. You know, you've heard me say that, but not all plants do. For example, Baptisia, really the only two bees I ever see on Baptisia are bumblebee and leafcutter bee. So when you hear me say it attracts a tremendous diversity of pollinators, keep at it, because not all, just, just remember, I, I'm, I'm saying that for a reason, not all plants do, but you know, you have plants for different reasons. But this, this is particular, um, you know, does, like, like mountain mint and sedum, which is not native, and um, you know, the, the eupatoriums. Uh, some, some more summer snapshots, nice combo of passion flower and obedient plant. Here's the yellow passion flower. A lot of people are not as familiar, Passiflora lutea. I've had several groups of people pull, stripping this out of the garden thinking it's a weed. It's pretty mind boggling. I'm like, why would you weed a garden, someone else's garden? <laughs> I paid money and put that plant in there. Um, here's that uh, Dalea purpurea again, a close up with the bumblebee. Look at that pollen basket, full, beautiful orange pollen. Um, this is what this is the Appalachian mountain mint, um, Pycnanthemum flexuosum, the thread waisted wasp. Um, just a nice shot of one of the, the beds in the summer with the Culver's root. Way in back is the Silphium cup plant. Oh, one of my favorite vines. I love this so much. This is spurred butterfly pea. Centrosema virginianum, and um, it's a very low growing vine. I planted as a ground cover. And I experimentally planted it in a bed that gets a lot of deer pressure. And I'm happy to report the deer do not bother it. It's got this beautiful kind of upside down flower shape. Um, looks like an orchid. It blooms mostly in the morning. It, it blooms for months. And as you can see, the bumblebees love it. Mm, can't wait to see that again. Um, Agastache funiculum, it's a bee magnet. Uh, this is a sunflower bee on orange cone flower, Rebecca Folgita. Um, the Stokes Aster with one of the Liatris microcephala, very small Liatris species. There's our rattlesnake master again. Just another shot. One of the phloxes with cone flower. Okay, once I do the fall blooming, I'm gonna pause for questions and then we're getting not too far from the end. But so some of my fall blooming, again, on the asters, I've got about 13 different species. Uh, aromatic aster is a, it's a kind of a mound shaped aster. This is um, Symphiotricum oblongifolium. This Eastern silvery aster, it, it just blooms along the stem. It's very kind of wiry stems, very unusual. Can certainly handle part shade. It's beautiful, that's uh, con color is the species. The frost aster has a tiny, tiny little flower. Now this, this plant, I would warn you, I learned the hard way. I no longer plant it in mixed beds with other species because it just takes over. Um, if you've got an area of your yard that you don't mind, you know, a bank or something, it is a pollinator magnet, but it doesn't play well with other plants. It just wants to take over and you have to spend a lot of time pulling it out. So that's, I've done that. 
uh, one of the golden rods. This is a uh, uh, Rugosa, Soledago Rugosa fireworks. And I have several species of ironweed in the garden, the Vernania. This is the stemless ironweed, Vernania acaulis, which I love. And um, the Monardas, this is the uh, Eastern horse mint, Monarda punctata, late blooming. <coughs> Little honeybee tucked up in there, enjoyed by the wasp, like this great black wasp. Climbing aster is a nice um, woody vine. Um, and it's great. This is a, this is it over the top of a trellis. You can't see the trellis. It's kind of under there. And then I've learned, I tried experimentally planting it as a shrub and I found that it actually performs very well as a shrub. You just got to keep it pruned and it's a late bloomer. It'll, it'll even put, have some blooms in the winter if it's not too hard of a winter in close up of the kind of lavender blooms and the butterflies love it as well. So there's some fall color on your um, your Amsonia with the aster, um, Gallardia, you know, and, and Solidago. One of your Gallardias again with a stiff leaf aster. There's sunflower bee on the uh, ironweed. One of the native asters with a, a surfeit fly. I love this uh, white, that was a white uh, uh, goldenrod, Solidago bicolor, really love it. It's hard to find now though. I wish I could find more of it. One of the long-tailed skippers on the climbing aster. Beautiful, um, I love that species. And the coral honeysuckle with the climbing aster. Um, so again, I urge you to go to my website. I've got a lot of stuff up there. Um, you know, I started doing the virtual garden tours. These are usually 10 to 15 minute videos. I do one each month. I have four of them up. Um, we had a cyber attack in October, so it ate my October one. So I have June through September. I've got a list of all the plants in the garden. I've got also monthly bloom slideshows that are just about three minutes long. We can see lots of photos are all um, captioned with the species. Um, so every, every two weeks I go around and record what's blooming and that's archived back about 11 years. So you can go and see usually starting in April, going to October, November. And, and you've got uh, what's blooming that particular week. In a normal year, when I'm doing garden tours, I've got the schedule up there and then a bunch of other information. A lot of things I talked about with pollinators also apply to birds. So think about what birds need. Um, so birds do need insects, mainly caterpillars, as I talked about earlier, to rear their young. Um, and so the best way to provide that is to, you know, hopefully you have already in your yard, you know, in your edge of your woodlands, you might already have some of these important keystone plants. Maybe you didn't know they were important keystone plants and now you'll look at them a little differently. Um, but those things um, are, prov are really providing hosts for those caterpillars. Uh, birds need, you know, fruit, seeds, nuts, and nectar, depending on the species. They need nesting material and nesting sites and they need protective cover. So think about the different types of fruits that birds enjoy. Um, there's soft mass fruits. So those are your soft fruits. So in the spring, that would be things like service berry, which by the way, I'm not a bird, but I also really find very tasty. <laughs> um, red mulberry, blueberry. I do have some you know, native blueberries in the garden, but they've kind of gotten choked out by other stuff. In the summer, that would be, you know, your blackberries, sumac, black cherry, elderberry, the fringe tree fruits that look like little olives. I have those in the garden. In the fall, you know, a dogwood, poison ivy. You know, maybe, maybe some people are not aware that poison ivy, as much as we love to hate it, actually provides a lot of benefits to wildlife. So as long as it's not in an area where it's going to be a risk to you, then please don't feel like you have to rip it all out you know, as long as you're not gonna brush by it every time you do something in the yard. Uh, your viburnums, your gallberries, I have those in the garden, um, you know, persimmons and whatnot. And then the winter, even now, um, you know, holly, cedar, winterberry, possum haw. Some of your hard mass fruits and seeds. So these would be um, examples of those, you know, in the spring, you know, everything from your Swiss grass, river birch, red maple, summer, um, you know, black eyed Susan, sunflowers and whatnot. You can see the list here. And again, you know, um, I'm gonna point you some resources at the end that you can go into more detail on this. And again, you've got the recording.
So here's a, again, I get so excited when I see birdies in my pollinator garden. It just makes me so happy. So this is tall tick seed, uh, Coryopsis triptyrus, and the, the, the one behind it is the red rose mallow. So there's a, a goldfinch enjoying uh, the seeds of that. Um, here's a, a, a goldfinch on the uh, coneflower. So yeah, those coneflowers look a little ratty, you know, and you might think, oh, I need to cut those back, but don't please, because the birds are gonna be happy to eat those seeds for you. Look, we're going to town. That makes me happy. And here's a mockingbird enjoying the, uh, the, the fruit of the possum hall, Ilex decidua. Uh, then you have your hummingbird. So, you know, hummingbirds pollinate over 160 of our native plant species in the US. Um, and as y'all probably are aware, they do like those nice tubular flowers to get the nectar. I think people underestimate how many insects that, that hummingbirds eat, insects and spiders. And they also rely on spider webs to help uh, form uh, their, their nest. So think of some native plants for hummingbirds that will be helpful to them as far as shrubs go. Uh, things that uh, like button bush, the New Jersey tea, you know, red buckeye, your, your native azaleas are all good choices. Sweet pepper bush, that's the clethra. And then you've got some of your vines like the coral honeysuckle, cross vine, passion flower. Carolina jessamine are all good choices for, for vines and lots of different perennials that are great for hummingbirds. Um, I'm gonna show you some pictures. So here's the, uh, the red cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. Uh, there's that little pinstemon again, the small uh, beard tongue, pinstemon smallii. Uh, here's a nice uh, monarda that likes the shade, um, Bradburiana. Um, there's a hummingbird moth on the uh, bee balm. Fistulosa. Here's if you can see the hummingbird there on uh, the obedient plant. And then the liatris, uh, the columbines, they love the fire pinks, the sp uh, silene, excuse me, uh, Virginiana, and flocks or uh, hummingbird attractive, and the red rose mallow. Hibiscus coccinius. Oh, I, I, I really uh, became enamored of the pink turtle heads last year and um, I, I planted a lot more of them and um, I just love it. They like some shade, so I don't have a whole lot of space for them, but the Indian pink also likes shade and the hummingbirds like this. Okay, so now what I'm gonna end up with is to show you, I wanna show y'all, cause people always will ask me, well, I have shade or I have this or I have that. What can I plant? Well, I'm going to I'm going to show you some tools that you can use to help you identify species appropriate for your landscape. And remember, I rounded all these up and emailed them to Nancy and she's going to email you the list. So you have the links. You don't have to write these down. So um, uh, NC State has a great website called uh, Going Native, Native Plants Attractive to Wildlife. And if you go there, you can um, you can you can uh, select the plant type. You know, like you're I want to what kind of trees can I plant or what kind of vines or wildflowers. So you select that, and then you can basically you know provide your parameters or your conditions in your yard. You know, what kind of uh, light uh, light do you have? Full sun, part shade. Is it moist? Is it dry? Do you need something deer resistant? You can put that all in there and click it, and then see what it comes up with. So that'll be something fun to try. And then you've got the National Wildlife Federation has a native plant finder. And again, you can put in your zip code, you go there, um, you put in your zip code, and then it's really cool. It spits out these plants and then it gives you the um, different genera for your zip code. And if you look on each one, like this one is goldenrod where you see the black circle, it shows you um, how many butterfly and moth species it supports. And then if you click on that, if you click on one like sunflower, if you zero in on one, and then it tells you it attracts 64 species of butterflies and moths in your area. And then it gives you the top 15 and you can click on those and learn more. So here's clicking on one of those. So you can really kind of dive deep on these. It's, you can, it's a great rainy day winter activity, trust me. Okay, so here's another tool, plants for birds, the National Audubon Society. 
So you go to that website, you put in your, um, your uh, email address and they're gonna send you um, tips and information. Um, and then you can also put in your, look at their native plants database, you put in your zip code again. And the other neat thing it does is it'll tell you the, um, you know, the chapter, your local chapter that's near you for the Audubon Society. In my area, it's a new hope. And y'all probably have one in your area, I'm assuming. Uh, but you, once you put in your zip code, this is really cool. If you click buy now, the other neat thing is it'll generate a list of uh, native plant nurseries in your, in your area. So that's pretty cool. And I looked at them. I'm like, yep, those are really there. <laughs> that looks pretty comprehensive, you know. So I thought that was cool. Okay, so this is the list of resources that Nancy's going to send you that I sent her. These are all the cooperative extension ones. Um, I haven't even mentioned some of these. So, um, uh, you know, you can look at these. Um, I, I didn't have time to show you all these. Uh, the, the one at the bottom there, the extension gardener plant toolbox is also very comprehensive and, um, you know, gives you all kinds of information on different plants. You can enter species and, and look up you know, plants for appropriate for you. And then these are the non-extension ones here, um, you know, that are, that I talked about. And the Xerces Society, which Nancy works for, has some great uh, regional plant lists. And that is, by the way, one of my very favorite nonprofits working on for pollinators. Absolutely. Highly respect the work that they do around the country. Um, I included this Forest Service tree seedling store because that can give you a source of, um, um, you know, if you, if you had a large area that you wanted to plant, especially, you know, um, that's another option. Um, and then um, on my um, website, I've got a list of some local nurseries as well. But, you know, look for the native plant nurseries, um, you know, and, and support those in your area. Um, so this is, again, the, um, the videos I have. I'm just kind of, this is a great time to look at those videos because it'll kind of give you some ideas for what you might want to plant um, and just get you some ideas of what's going on in the garden and kind of get you fired up. Okay, so bed prep. So I am, okay, so I'm a fan of no-till if I can get away with it. <laughs> um, so for example, often if I'm going, it, it depends on the history. If you're, if you're breaking ground, like if you're removing lawn, you know, to plant pollinator or wildlife habitat, that's a different story. So that's, I've done that plenty of times as well. Uh, different ways to do that. I don't use any herbicides or anything. Um, so I would do it mechanically through repeated tillage to remove the, um, you know, whatever lawn grass you're talking about. The disadvantage of that is you're burning up organic matter, you know, when you till. You can, you know, do uh, tarping, um, cardboard, that can take, you know, that, that works, it takes months but do whatever you need to do to remove the grass. You definitely want a soil test. Um, and then um, you, know, you might may or may not want to put down compost. So what I mean by no-till is if you have an area, uh, like the, the pollinator garden, um, those beds were already there, but there was nothing in them. So the, in other words, they had been built, you know, and uh, mulched like years before I got there. And so it had very old mulch. I saw no advantage to tilling up that whole bed. So what we did is we put a thin layer of compost down on top and then, um, uh, you know, dug individual plant holes. I expanded into a new bed uh, a couple of years ago that had um, Japanese Zelkova trees, this, this non-native tree, um, which is a very poor choice for a parking lot that's surrounded by asphalt because the tree is very heat intolerant. So that, that was one of the few cases where we preemptively removed those mature trees because they were providing zero wildlife value. So I convinced the, the landowner to do that. And in between the mature trees were the uh, juniper, this awful non-native juniper. This, again, nothing, blah. So that... So we got all that out, and 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 uh, again, I didn't see necessarily any reason to till that whole bed. So we put down some compost. So if I can get away with not tilling, I do that. So my bed prep is usually adding a little bit of compost, making sure any grass is out, um, and then and then plant, and then mulch, and then make sure you get that adequate water for the first year. You do want a soil test, you know. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so primarily my habitat there at the pollinator is full sun. 
I wish I had more shade. Uh, I know a lot of y'all wish you had more sun, um, but many, many species in the garden can do very well with part sun. Um, and so what I mean is I wish I had more shade, like I could plant some, like I have small areas of shade and that's where I've put my spice bush, uh, the, the colony, the turtle heads and things like that, white wood aster. Um, yeah. So yeah, so mostly my habitat is full sun, preferably for pollinators, they do prefer full sun, but you can get by with part sun. You're not going to have a great pollinator habitat in, in full shade. Uh, because those tend to be primarily more foliage heavy than flower. Oh, we pull. But keep in mind that a lot of the things that we're pulling are rhizomatous. So you're leaving little pieces behind that are going to re-sprout. But um, we do the best we can. Our, our primary weed in the summer is Bermuda grass. <laughs> because mm. some of the beds border a Bermuda grass lawn. So that's a never ending battle. Um, and right now we're dealing with Creeping Charlie, uh, Chickweed. Those are the two primary things we're dealing with now. Um, but yeah, we, we try to get it out. But the thing is, uh, when it's mulched, I don't, I don't dig, we don't dig them out. We only hand pull. I don't want to see exposed. I don't want to, you know, invert the soil uh, in that case. Okay. Uh, Julie Herbert asks, how do you keep up with thinning out plants? So again, when I'm doing a tour, I love to point out, um, the highly aggressive natives, <laughs> because I, we spend a lot of time managing our, our, our aggressive natives. Um, these are some of the asters, some, so again, not all the species, uh, Soledago rugosa, the, the, one of the golden rods, uh, the uh, aromatic aster, you know, uh, obedient plant. Um, so you're constantly thinning. Uh, Coryopsis triptyris, the tall tick seed, it'll seed it everywhere. The frost aster will, see, so you can spend a lot of time weeding out or thinning out plants. And it's just something you have to do. Um, I, I, like I said, I recently made the decision that I regret planting frost aster in a mixed perennial bed because it just takes over. And, I, and so I preemptively, in that new area where we took out the trees and the juniper, I had planted a couple of frost aster and I was kind of eyeing them all summer last year going, oh no. <laughs> and I, I actually ripped them out right before they're about to bloom. I was like, nope, I, I cannot have those in that bed. We spent a lot of time thinning out plants and some of these natives can can really take over like the, the Zizia. Some of them have tap roots and they're hard to pull out. I, I can usually tolerate a, an aggressive we, native if it's easy to pull out. So passion flower, yeah, it's very weedy, but it's really easy to pull out. Uh, you know, obedient plants, easy to pull out. It, aster as well. Things like the golden Alexander, not easy to pull out because of that taproot. You may be overwatering them. Um, they don't need a lot of water. Once they're established, they don't need watering at all. Uh, so I, they prefer full sun. They can, you know, some species can certainly do okay in part sun. Um, Without knowing any more about your conditions, I don't know what to say, but but you really don't, you shouldn't have to water them if they're established. I'm a fan of bird feeders. I don't do the hummingbird feeders. I just can't keep up. <laughs> and I used to. Um, I do, I do feed birds. Um, you know, so I used to have pollinator gardens at home. Uh, I have four dogs. <laughs> Well, and basically once I started the pollinator garden in Pittsburgh, which is about 20 miles from my house, I don't have time to do my garden at home, right? I mean, it just went to pot. It's like the cobbler's daughter, as they say, you know. Um, so, so because I no longer really have pollinator habitat at home, for, which also of course would feed the birds, I, I set up a bird feeding station. I really enjoy doing that. And um, I have a heated bird bath, the whole thing. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. But 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 if I had if I had the pollinator garden at my house, um, you know, I would be doing less of that for sure. I hope y'all will come visit. Like I said, the garden is open to the public. Um, I will warn you that the plants are not labeled. Um, that is a huge task to maintain plant signage, and I I, I intended initially to do that, but it's not in the end you know, where I decided to invest my efforts. Um, that's why I have on the website, you know, what's in bloom, you know, for that week, I've got plant list. So, you know, 
I encourage you to look at the garden tour videos and come on a, on a live tour when I'm able to do those again. But people do come on their own and walk around. It's just may not be as easy to, you know, know what things are sometimes because they're not, I don't have these fancy signs there. A lot of the species that I have are kind of wet species. I like, like, I mean, off the top of my head, you can have ironweed, bone set, joe pie weed, uh, button bush, uh, culver's root, swamp milkweed. <laughs> you can have lots of great stuff. And, and, and I encourage you to look at the, um, the Mellow Marsh Farm uh, website. They're a native wetland uh, nursery. They're a wholesale nursery. Okay. based in my county chatham county um now so they kind of specialized in the in the wet plants but um they also have things that would do well in uh, you know upland soils there's maintenance year round um you know right now we're a little bit behind because of the weather <laughs> um right now the focus is on winter annual weeding which we do all by hand of course um, and then we'll be um, a little bit later in the winter. So late February, early March, we're going to cut everything back, you know, basically because we're waiting, waiting to the very last minute, you know, um, before everything starts growing again. And then we'll do a little mulching. Um, you know, I do. So mulching. Is, okay. Some people are anti mulch, but I will tell I'm not. Um, I, I provide plenty of bare ground habitat for nesting bees because that's usually why people are anti-mulch. That's one of the reasons. Uh, I, this was really poor soil here. Heavy clay, dead soil. Hardwood mulch breaks down and decomposes and it increases the organic matter content You know, year after year, has really improved the tilth of the soil. Um, and, and, and the earthworms are, you know, abundant and it's really increased the biodiversity and the, the soil food web. So, uh, but, and, and less, I'll use less and less mulch over the years because, you know, the garden has matured. Um, we don't do, we've never used any kind of fertilizer in the garden. You do not need to fertilize these, these native plants at all. I know that's really surprising to people. Uh, again, I don't use any pesticides. So maintenance during the growing season is, is primarily hand weeding. It's some deadheading of things to keep them blooming. Uh, for plant species that have a more pronounced bloom season, we, we just let them, you know, we don't cut them back when they're done blooming because we want the birds to enjoy the seed. Um, so primarily the maintenance in, in the summer, in the you know, spring, summer, fall is weeding. Um, and I do all the hand watering if there's, you know, newly planted species.